Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm here to talk about vibrational dimensions, spiritism and science. And I hope you will forgive me, my health vibrations are not in harmony at the moment. I'm trying to overcome the flu here. But uh, let me set this device here. There, I'm all hooked up. All right, so today I'm going to talk about aspects of vibrations that exist in the spirit world and the efforts of scientists to understand and explain the vibratory nature of the universe and the relationship between science and religion in spiritist teachings and how spiritist teachings guide scientific endeavors and how spiritist teachings are really the, the light that leads the way for science. But science also keeps spiritism honest and helps to keep it from uh, falling by the wayside into superstition and ignorance. But also we wish to acknowledge the limitations of science with regard to the study of what I will call the imponderable, which is a term we've heard often in spiritism. And I just want to begin by saying I know, I remember when I first became acquainted with spiritism, that I really had to struggle with accepting what to me was rather fantastical concepts and ideas of spiritism. Uh, given the fact that I had come from a religious background that uh, did not give me an awful lot to work with uh, as far as imagining what the spirit world might be like, you know, beyond angels and clouds and things like that. So, of course, that perception has changed over the 20 years period in which I've been exposed to spiritism. But I still remember feeling this way when I, when I heard about things like entire spiritual colonies that were built by thought projection with modified cosmic fluids, spirits who could allow themselves to be seen or to be not seen at will, and uh, travel at the speed of thought, all these kinds of things. And not to mention the, the harmonious vibratory connection between mediums and spirits. And, of course, the non-harmonious, unsought, unwanted vibratory connections between spirits and incarnates, spirits and spirits, in other words, obsessions, fascinations, and subjugations. I speak to my obsessor over here. Yes. So all these uh, phenomena set my head spinning. And I remember uh, those early days thinking how it just seemed that science couldn't shed any light on these things. I often found myself doubting the veracity of what I was reading. But I kept studying, I kept learning, and I think it was largely because of the Spirits book. And uh, let me make sure this thing work here. There we go. The Spirits book by the great codifier Alan Kardec, and also the Gospel according to Spiritism. It was the logic, the clear headedness, in the, 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 the great clarity, the, the beautiful language that I encountered in these works that drew me in, especially the language. I'm a, I'm a former English major in college, let us say, once an English major, always an English major, that's what I've heard. I suppose that's true. So this, more than anything, convinced me that there was value in spiritism and that I should continue my efforts in spite of my doubts. So, and they were bolstered in no small part by the fact that uh, Kardec himself, as I learned, was a skeptic. He, he proceeded from a place of extreme skepticism as he began his own studies. And uh, he continued, and he found logic and reason. So he began these investigations into these phenomena. He encountered the raps, the table turnings, uh, eventually the communications of spirits through mediums, which was the breakthrough for him to confirm the intelligent source of these unusual occurrences. So anyway, always I have nevertheless retained a healthy skepticism. And I've always looked for scientific explanations for things. I think it's uh, possibly a very American trait. And, uh, however, these things could not always be obtained. And the, the difficulty lies in the fact of imponderability, which is something I'm going to talk about in this speech. I'll get to that in a few minutes. But first, I would like you to behold this child's toy. Little prop I brought with me. 
Look what it can do. Ooh, it's magic. Isn't that fascinating? The shape that it creates, these shapes that come out of nothing, it's nothing more than some cellophane and, and pieces of string, an amalgam that puts us together and gives this ability to create this thing out of nothing. So, why am I showing you this? Well, let me set this aside. As I say, when I pull on the strings, it, it creates something that we didn't see before. And it does seem to be out of magic. Though, as, as good spiritists, we, we don't believe in magic, do we? Please say yes. Okay. <laughs> but the creation of the pattern is too fast for our eyes to follow, basically. So it blurs into these, into these curved shapes that seem to materialize before our eyes. This child's toy, if, if a toy can create these shapes that we had not imagined possible, then why should we be so surprised that spirits can appear and disappear? Or, or that entire spiritual cities can exist, created by the power of thought. Uh, this is mentioned in uh, the book No Solar by Minister Veneranda. And uh, she talks about, she states, thought is our universal language, and mental creation plays a very important role in our lives. So what does she mean here? Well, in the book, we learn, along with Andre, a, a great many things about life in the spirit world. And we're told that the very buildings of Nosolar are sustained by thought vibrations. You're going to hear this word a lot, vibrations. So many of the, ha the inhabitants are also vibrationally attuned to one another so that they are telepathic. And we learn that the water of Nosolar, through the work of the Ministry of the Divine Union, is infused with magnetic energy. And then the Ministry of Assistance comes along and adds nutritional and medical components so that by itself this water is sufficient to meet the nutritional needs of the inhabitants of Nosolar. Now, this is where the concept of imponderability comes in. Okay. You know, here it says ponderability, that which we can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. Imponderable, that which is beyond our five senses. Okay. So this is the difficulty. Here on Earth, we build our buildings with stone, brick, wood, and metal. But in Nosolar, they were able to create through thought vibrations. Why the difference? Well, it goes back to the cosmic principle. And uh, I have a thing on that here. The cosmic principle, the subtle fundamental unifying element, substance, that gives rise to phenomena such as heat, magnetism, and electricity, and to matter itself. Magnetism, heat, electricity, all of those are invisible, by the way. But we know them by the effects that they create. So we trust that the, even though we can't see them, we know they are there. Now, it's because spirits are free from the gross matter of physical bodies, and those spirits have achieved, uh, and then there are those spirits who have achieved sufficient purification and learning so that they're able to manipulate the ethereal aspect of the cosmic principle, that they can do this. So this is the, the two states of the cosmic principle. It breaks down. First, we have materialization that gives rise to the phenomena of the visible material world. Okay, and then we have etherealization that gives rise to the phenomena of the invisible world. So this is a modification of the cosmic principle that, again, is beyond our senses. And, um, so it, to us, it's imponderable. And that's where the difficulty with science comes in. Science attempts to understand the universe by analyzing and measuring phenomena of the physical world. It's very difficult to measure and analyze things you can't see, hear, touch, taste, or smell. The difficulty, of course, is emphasized by Kardec. And he talks about this in Genesis. He says, our material organs have limited perceptions which render them powerless to see certain things, sometimes even material objects. As you know, uh, dogs can hear things we can't hear. You know, hawks flying overhead can see much more than we can. Uh, we're very limited, us humans, in what we're able to, to apprehend with our senses. But still, Spiritism emphasizes that it's important to maintain a collaboration amongst philosophy and uh, of course, science and religion. Here we have the relationship showing here. 
which I uh, borrowed from uh, Explore Spiritism. And uh, so we have this attempt to understand the universe, analyzing, measuring phenomena of the physical world. And we have the relationship where religion kind of guides along science, and science buoys up religion by keeping it from uh, gross errors. I mean, where would we be without science? We'd still believe the Earth is flat. We'd believe the sun revolves around the Earth. We'd believe the Earth is 6,000 years old. And we'd believe dinosaurs don't exist because you know, the fossil records are false, and those are there just as a test from God. Well, we don't believe that, of course. So, but it's important to note that uh, early religions were an attempt to integrate science and religion. If we look, you know, Kardec points out this fact that these early religions uh, brought those two together, the best science that they had available at the time. So, we can look at the words from the Gospel of John, for instance. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Or the other version, the Word was with God and the Word was God. In the beginning of the Word was already existing. And what is a word but a breath? That it is a, a thought that is materialized. It is a vibration. And that, of course, is what this next one is about. Om. There's a, very, a strong similarity between the, the words of John and this concept of Om in the Hindu uh, mythology. So they believe creation began, that as creation began, the divine, all-encompassing consciousness took the form of the first and original vibration manifesting as the sound Om. They say that all of creation is in this word, Om. And they divide it up between the, the three, the triumvirate of the Hindus, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma, the creator, <laughs> Vishnu, the preserver and Shiva the destroyer. All of those are in that word. So vibration, they're saying, that the world, the universe, vibrated into existence. And this is in very much in keeping with what Spiritism teaches. So, we're getting back to our story here. So what uh, this is telling me, it's an attempt at the beginning of things. And science has a place in this at the beginning of things. And the problem that happened here, what occurred, unfortunately, was this division between science and religion, which caused science to be set aside, to be relegated to being nothing more than a compiling of facts and figures, measuring things that had no connection, no meaning to what the world was all about. So what Spiritism tells us is that we need to come back to that. We need to bring them back together so that they can buoy one another up. So, but just to finish on my thought with this, this, uh, this Hinduism, uh, it's amazing to, uh, to look at the coincidences here with the Big Bang and the oscillating universe. You know, the Hinduism actually is saying that the universe vibrated into being, the breath of Brahma, okay, or a day of Brahma, uh, which lasts uh, something like about uh, 4,000, 4,320,000 years. And then the night of Brahma, the intake of the breath of Brahma, the universe was sucked back into uh, a focal point. And that's exactly what this is saying. This is a modern day theory. Uh, the Big Bang sends all matter flying out, and then it goes to a certain point, and then it starts coming back in, and then collapses in on itself. And of course, they say it takes 10 to 20 billion years, which is a little longer than 4 million. So the length of time doesn't correspond, but the concept does, and I think that's pretty amazing. And uh, so again, this is an attempt to use science, wedded to religion, to explain the universe. And uh, as I say, this was an unfortunate development that it, that it came apart, and uh, you know, religion became the enemy of science. I mean, it got to a point where Religion became dogma, where religion became sacred, and you cannot tread on these sacred truths. So science attempting to impede on these things with its progress uh, was not welcomed, because religion was, uh, was, was forming a, a body that uh, they wanted to preserve. They wanted to make it into ritual. They wanted to uh, turn it into something that 
eschewed any further development. You know, uh, we have all the great discoveries have been made. Who said that? Some English lord said that. All the great discoveries have been made. That was back in the 19th century. Obviously, uh, he was wrong. So even in science, there are those that are somewhat recalcitrant, somewhat unwilling to move forward. So, so this is an attempt to wed religion to science. And uh, unfortunately, this still goes on, this, uh, this division. I, I'd like to share a story with you that I think illustrates this pretty well. I once attended a lecture by a scientist who was speaking on the theories of quantum physics. And at some point he stated that an atom at one end of the universe seemed to be aware, aware of, and react to another atom at the other end of the universe. What he was talking about here was a concept called quantum entanglement. Uh, simply stated, says that at the subatomic level, uh, two entangled objects, perhaps electrons, uh, no matter how far apart you put them, remain entangled. In spite of the fact that there are no forces, no strings, no pulleys, like on my little toy there, connecting these objects. So at least not any of you that you can see with your senses anyway. So this means that what happens to one object will affect the other. Uh, of course, we could talk about the quaintness of the idea that the universe has ends, but let's get back to the point here. You know, I went up to the scientist afterwards, after, the, uh, after his lecture, and I asked him if he thought that this idea of atomic awareness might support the belief in the omnipresence of God. It's something that seemed to click in my mind, this idea, the omnipresence of God, an awareness and of course we have varying concepts of what God is, but an awareness in the entire universe. God is not the universe, God is outside of that, that's another spiritist teaching. But somehow, you know, that God is aware of every head, on, every hair on your head, and the number of hairs on your head, we've heard that. So, he looked at me as if I had asked him for his firstborn child, <laughs> and he simply replied, no, and very hastily walked away. So. For me, this, uh, you know, this meant that for him, the very idea that science could support or in any way illuminate a theological concept was patently absurd. So this, uh, you know, of course things are changing. I do want to say that. Uh, one of the greatest minds of the, of the 20th century, Albert Einstein, he saw the need for religion and science to reunite. And we're all familiar with this picture. Science without religion is lame. Religion without science is blind. And uh, so that was a belief of Albert Einstein. He was one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. He was uh, made man of the century, I think, in Time magazine when the year 2000 came along. And uh, of course, this begs the question, though, how, are, how does science and religion fit together? That's the question. And Kardec, uh, he does shed some light on this relationship, and this is what he has to say. Science without spiritism finds itself powerless to explain certain phenomena, uh, the laws of matter alone, spiritism without science would lack support and control. So he makes it a little more clear with that, with that quote. But again, we see Kardec pointing out in Genesis that uh, he says, the spiritual essence of things cannot be perceived by material organs. It is only by spiritual vision that we can, that we can see spirits and the substances of the immaterial world. He's using uh, his spiritual glasses, like I am here. Okay, but uh, no, I can't see anything through my glasses other than you. So, so he's, he's giving us that. So it's, it's worth noting that this inability of science to verify spiritist teachings, all, although that it does have this inability, it doesn't really detract from its usefulness. And uh, as noted here, you know, the question in this spirit's book, are we allowed to receive advanced teachings about matters that are beyond the scope of our senses in science? Well, it says yes. At times, the creator may find it useful to reveal things that are beyond the competence of science to explain. To me, this is uh, holding the carrot out on the stick. Uh, this is basically an inducement to humanity to uh, not be lazy. We have this shining truth that we are given by spiritism and we struggle to comprehend it. We struggle from our material standpoint to come to grips with what we are being shown by spiritism. So, you know, it serves as an incentive. 
to continue the attempt to meet the challenge. So for humankind to use the tools of science to grow and progress. And uh, we have also this uh, in slide uh, here that says, can't we penetrate some of nature's secrets through science? Well, scientific research is a means of advancing in every direction, but we still face limitations. So we always have limitations. Yes, we use it, but yes, we can. It's a little confusing. So, uh, one thing that uh, I wanted to add to this, that can, we can only do this, only use uh, it as a tool by approaching the attempt to understand the universe with humility and respect by avoiding the attack, the trap of reductionism. Uh, we may be familiar with this, uh, René Descartes, who uh, said that the nature of complex things can always be reduced, explained by simpler or more fundamental things. Well, the latest science is really going against this. This, uh, this has become an outmoded way of thinking. Science has become more holistic. And here we have holism, which denies reductionist thinking and says properties as a whole are not explainable from the properties of their parts. So that, you know, the part, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, another way to put that. So, and I think it might be helpful at this point to, to look at the concept of holons. Uh, this was something that was put forth by Arthur Kessler. He was a, a writer and journalist, uh, World War I and World War II. He wrote some novels against, uh, it was anti totality anti-totalitarian novels that he wrote. Uh, so, so he made some significant contributions, but what he was saying here is we are a whole unto ourselves and we are a part of the whole. And uh, you know, basically there are two tasks of a whole on. Uh, one is uh, the agency to survive as a whole, as a separate entity, and communion to engage in a successful communion with other holons to form a greater whole. Okay, and uh, we here see here some of these stages, uh, the uses that this concept of the holon can be put to. You know, the moving up from matter to body to mind to soul to spirit, this progressive uh, movement uh, to greater consciousness. And this also can be applied to uh, the concept of the individual integrating with the larger society, relationships, groups, society, all the way on up to the universe, omniverses, and all that is. So actually looking beyond the concept of the universe, which is something we need to do. Interesting idea, there's something beyond the universe. Okay. So we see these stages of growth, and the main point he's trying to make here about human progress using this model is that each successive stage of growth that we achieve transcends all the previous stages. And also that the previous stages are absolutely necessary to achieve each new transcendent stage. So this idea is very much in harmony with the spiritist view that human beings on earth at their current stage of development, spiritual development I'm talking about here, simply cannot pretend, they cannot comprehend, they can't pretend to comprehend the full majesty of God's creation. And uh, this is made clear in Kardec's discussion of the purification of the soul, when he says, the imperfections of the soul are like veils which obscure its light. Every imperfection, when removed, leaves one veil less. But it is only after becoming completely purified that it enjoys the full plenitude of its faculties. Uh, this was part of a discussion of uh, the view of God, asking, can we see God? Well, we can't. And this is why. So our progress toward understanding all that is depends on our moral progress. But, of course, Spiritism also points out that our intellectual progress is needed as well. So we need both of them, moving hopefully at the same pace. Though we often run into people who are highly morally developed but not intellectually and vice versa. And the, the people that came from Capella, as we are told, uh, that uh, came and populated the earth in, uh, as part of a plan to bring the earth forward, uh, scientifically, technologically. These were people that had great knowledge. We're talking about the civilization of uh, Egypt, for example. Had great knowledge, and they brought that to earth and, and helped us to progress. But they also needed to progress morally, so they came to a backward planet where they had to really dig in their heels, and this helped them to grow morally suffering helps us to grow. 
So intellectual progress is also needed. This is where science comes in, and it certainly can be said that science has made significant strides in some areas. Uh, for instance, uh, there are some things that we can point to that science has done. Uh, the study of the past, the laying out of hands. Uh, we have some information on that I'll share with you. We have here a, a book called Vibrational Medicine. Uh, author is Richard Gerber, MD. He talks about the work of a Dr. Bernard Grad of McGill University in Montreal, who after recognizing the potential of therapeutic and spiritual healing. So he sees, he has an open mind, and he sees that it's doing something. And he's, he's asking from a scientist's point of view, why is this happening? Is there some way that I can measure it, that I can show that this is real? And he sets about uh, uh, an experiment. He decides it's time to, for, for science to step in and answer the question. Is uh, this a, a healing or is it just uh, a fraud? So uh, he goes back in history looking at uh, Mesmer. Uh, back in the 18th century, you may know, uh, remember Franz Mesmer. Uh, he talked a lot about uh, laying out of hands and uh, magnetized water and the use of these things as a therapeutic. Uh, but the scientists of his time rejected him because they said, well, there's a factor here. We think that what's really going on is that these people believe in you or they believe in God, and it is their faith that's causing them to think that they're feeling better. So we, we don't, don't accept this as science. So he tried to isolate this factor away. He tested animals and plants with the reasoning that animals and plants don't really have their faith in, in God. They don't have their faith in Mesmer. They don't have faith in uh, the treated water or so on. So I'll share with the case of plants, for instance, uh, had received water treated by healing passes. And of course, there was a control group treated with water. They did not re receive the healing pass. And the plants with the water that was treated grew larger in size than plants that were more, that had not. And they were also more abundant in chlorophyll. So this is a clear evidence that the healing passes produce a measurable effect. And then uh, later, another uh, uh, scientist, Dr. Robert Miller, built on this work. He studied, he was studying also the biological effects of healers. And he was able to experimentally confirm that when this pass was done over water, that uh, this produced uh, a magnetic field, which it was discernible. And the magnetic field, he, he did that by utilizing a, uh, an instrument called a uh, Dunoy type tensiometer. Okay, there it is. And this is what science has to do. It has to create better and better instruments uh, to extend our senses, our capabilities to understand, to apprehend things which may be beyond our own human ability to apprehend. And so this is the, the path that we have to take. So using this instrument, he discovered that the energies were in there, uh, that uh, the water had undergone a kind of um, transformation that made it more absorbable. And it, this caused the water to be uh, absorbed more easily by whoever drank the water and get the energies uh, were imbibed more easily in that way. So, and this validates the claim of Nosolar, which, uh, you know, that water, they say the nature of water is divine. This is also pictures of, from another investigator, uh, Dr. Masaru Imoto, the message from water. He did some testing which showed he was able to take pictures of the crystallization process of water which was, this was caused by the fact that simply somebody had done a pass. They showed the water beforehand, the water afterwards. So this is uh, creating something from this, uh, this procedure. And uh, the water is divine, so the water is a wonderful thing. It, it conducts energies, all kinds of energies, as they say in Nosolar, not just the energies that we're aware of. So I'd like to get back to my little toy that I showed you a minute ago. What does science have to say about the ability of spirits to make themselves visible and invisible at will? Well, how about absolutely nothing? But science does, uh, via string theory, 
Okay, we have string theory. It suggests the possibility of there being more than three dimensions. String theory basically says that all subatomic particles are made up of an infinitesimally tiny vibrating strings. Okay, the frequency of the vibration determines what kind of subatomic particle it makes, a neutron, proton, electron, etc., and the various combinations that make up all the elements that we know. So, and this is very interesting. This seems to be saying that the universe vibrated into existence. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Yes. yes. And we're getting back to that Hindu Om. We're getting back to, in the beginning was the word. So that's, that's very interesting uh, that science seems to be coming full circle back to this, this ancient wisdom. So, and then at least one string theory uh, suggests there may be as many as 26 dimensions. Most of them are 10 or 11, but even 10 or 11 is kind of mind-boggling. 26 dimensions? We only know how many? Three. So those, other t those others are what? Invisible to us. So again, science, while it may not be proving that spirits can make themselves visible or invisible, is saying a lot about visibility and invisibility. So, it suggests all these possibilities. And uh, there are other things, of course, more down-to-earth activities taking place within science that, uh, that talk about invisibility. For instance, we have the invention of the privacy screen. Computers, cell phones, and, uh, and other devices used to gather and send information. It's a step towards invisibility. I mean, we, all, we all know what these are for. Uh, they cause light to be refracted in one particular direction so the viewer can only see the data on the screen if they're positioned directly in front of it and others can't see it, okay? So this is a step towards invisibility, is it not? And then from there, it's just a small leap to, this, uh, to the attempt by scientists to create an invisibility cloak. Okay, we have invisibility scientists wearing these cloaks that at least partially obscure their forms. Okay, this is something like right out of Harry Potter, you know, his invisibility cloak. That's magic. This is not. This is science. So, again, this does nothing to explain the vibrational aspects of the spirit world, but at least it can help us to be more open and accepting when we make our little forays into the spiritist, spiritist literature and that describes these phenomena. So in the end, science is, as Kardec has said, inadequate in and of itself provide the answers we seek. It's only in partnership with religion and philosophy that we can forge ahead. And Leon Denis has something to say about this, about the need for this union. And he says, one doctrine alone can offer this, uh, one doctrine alone can offer this synthesis, excuse me, that of scientific spiritual research. So this is a combination. Already it shows a horizon to the world promises to illuminate the future. This philosophy, this science, free, independent, liberated from all official restrictions, from all compromising politics, is adding every day new and precious discoveries to its storehouse of knowledge. So it's possible for science to do great things, but only with the proper humility and reverence for that which is beyond human understanding. And Einstein showed this humility late in his life. He said, my religion consists of a humbling admiration for the, of the illimitable superior spirit who reveals himself in the slight details we are able to perceive with our frail and feeble minds. And this is from one of the strongest minds of the 20th century, certainly perhaps of all time. This is a man who had great powers of concentration, uh, which is what enabled him to come up with the great theories that he did. So, I will close with the proclamation of Jesus, who tells us, as I have done, so also may you do. In this simple statement, he tells us that the healing of the sick, the restoring of sight to the blind, the causing the lame to walk, all of these so-called miracles that he performed are things we also can do if we follow the path that he has already walked. Purifying our spirits, gaining in the higher knowledge that will reveal the application of natural laws upon which these accomplishments are based. So science, in its supporting role in the service of religion, will help us to steer clear of superstition and ignorance that would hold us back from our progress toward the light. 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today.